All right, welcome to your second set of video notes on echinoderms. So this set of video notes is going to focus on the class diversity, so all the different types of organisms that are classified as echinoderms. So we're going to start out with class Asteroidea. Now these include sea stars, and there's a roughly 1,500 species of these. So most of them are going to live on hard, hard substrates, and most of them are brightly colored, as you can see in the pictures here. This is typically what you think of when you think of a starfish. So some basic characteristics that they have, they usually have five arms that radiate from the center, they do have movable and fixed spines, and then they have that oral aboral surface. Some other things you need to know about them is they have dermal branchiae or papillae, which these are just thin folds of the body wall which help with gas exchange. They also have something called the ambulacral grove. Now if you groove, sorry, if you look here at this picture, it's going to run the length of the oral surface and it houses that radial canal we talked about and also rows of tubes, tube feet are on either side of this groove. So they move in a very coordinated stepping system. So it's coordinated by the nervous system, and it's an alternate extension, attachment, and contraction. And this is all tube feet moving in the same direction, but not necessarily in unison. And this also helps provide attachment during wave action or some rough waters. So they feed on snails, bivalves, crustaceans, coral, detritus, etc. They feed on quite a bit of different stuff. And their mouth actually op opens to a short esophagus and then to the stomach area. They do have two stomachs. They have a cardiac and a pyloric. So the cardiac stomach is the large oral stomach which receives the ingested food. The pyloric, on the other hand, is smaller, and it's on the aboral, it's the aboral stomach, and it absorbs that digested food. So here's just an example of how they feed on bivalves. So they wrap around the opening of the shell. The tube feet are going to actually attach to the outside of the shell, and they force the valves apart. The cardiac stomach then lowers into the bivalve, and it releases enzymes into the shell to help with the digestion, so it's partially digested at this point. That continued digestion occurs in the pyloric stomach, and the stomach retracts into sea stars. So they also have something that they're able to do called regeneration. And most people think about this when they think about starfish. So and in some cases, an entire sea star can actually regenerate from a piece of a broken arm. But very important that broken part must contain a portion of the central disc. So if you look here at this one, this sea star specifically is trying to regenerate three of its arms. And this complete regeneration may take up to a year, so it is not a quick process. In terms of reproduction, they are mostly dioecious, and there's two gonads in each arm that are present. They do have external fertilization, and it's coordinated by several environmental factors, such as length of light and dark, and the temperature of the water. The bipinaria larvae that they have are usually bilater bilaterally symmetric. They don't become pentaradial until they're adults. The next class we're going to talk about is Ophi Ophiorhodia, excuse me, which is also known as snake tail. There's over 2,000 of these species, and they are the most diverse group. It includes brittle stars and basket stars, and their arms are long, and they're sharply sent off, set off from the central disc. They're not that nice, even star that we saw with the other sea stars. That central disc, also it's important to note, has a pentagonal shape. So their water vascular system is not used for locomotion, which is an important difference. Their, cal their calcium carbonate plates, known as their ossicles, are actually modified to permit a unique form of grasping and movement. This results in a snake-like locomotion. And additionally, it's important to note that their tube feet do not have suction discs. They also are a little bit different in terms of their feeding and their maintenance. So they are predators and scavengers, and they will use their arms and tube feet to kind of sweep in food and trap plankton. They are also capable of regeneration and dioecious. Males, though, are typically smaller, and they're often carried by females, as you see in this picture here. The next class we're going to talk about is echinoidea. Now, these have roughly a 1,000 species, and the name means spiny. This includes sea urchins, sand dollars, and heart urchins. And these guys, they attach to hard substrates and they burrow in the sand. 
People typically don't always think about these guys as being part of echinoderms, but they do still have that symmetry that we talk about. So in these ones, the echinoderm, the, this echinoderm class, the skeleton, is called a test. It's made of 10 sets of closely fitting plates, which you will see if you look in this picture down here, you can kind of see the plates. So they, use by, they move by using these spines and they push against the substrate and their tube feet are used for pulling. Some sea urchins too, it's also important to note, have sharp spines and venom. So those can be pretty bad if you step on one of those. So in terms of their feeding, they feed on algae, coral, poly coral polyps, and dead animal remains. And they have a specialized chewing apparatus known as Aristotle's lantern. Their reproduction and development, once again, they're dioecious, and they do shed their gametes into the water, which results in external fertilization. Their larvae, though, undergo metamorphosis. The next class we're going to discuss is holoth holothuroidea. These are the sea cucumbers, and there's roughly 1,500 of these species. They do lack arms, and they have long, elongate bodies. Now, these have tube feet, and they're highly modified. They actually surround the mouth, and they're referred to roughly as tentacles. They're mostly sluggish. They burrow, and they kind of creep. They're not fast movers. Their locomotion using their tube feet is also inefficient, so they have to contract their body wall muscles, and they produce a worm-like movement to move. Their feeding, they use those specialized tentacles around their mouth to ingest particles. It's trapped by a mucus that's on the tentacles, and they put the tentacles into their mouth to just wipe off the food. They also have a stomach, a long looped intestine, a rectum, and an anus. So they are more elongate, so they have a different type of system than the starfish we've been talking about. Their respiration is also different because they use something called respiratory trees. So these are pairs of tubes which attach at the rectum and branch throughout the body. They pump water into the tubes through the rectum and that circulates it. This allows those gases and nitrogenous wastes that are exchanged between the water and coelom to be helping with the organism. So these respiratory trees are very important for this exchange. They are also not defenseless, as you may think. So they do produce toxins in their body walls, and in some of them, the respiratory trees can come out, and they'll actually turn inside out. So these tubules have toxins, and they're sticky. They can entangle predators, immobilize predators, and this also results in stress for the organism, unfortunately. So they can regenerate lost parts as well. In terms of reproduction, once again dioecious, they have a single gonad and they do also do external fertilization. Those tentacles were, are going to trap the eggs and bring them to the body surface for brooding. The embryos develop into a plankton-like larva, but they can also, interestingly enough, reproduce by transverse fission followed by regeneration. So they're a little more worm-like than some of the other animals in this phylum. The final class we're going to talk about is class Crinoidea. Now there's only about 630 of these living species and they're referred to as sea lilies and feather stars. So they're the most primitive of all living echinoderms and there's an extensive fossil record for these indicating that there were high numbers during the Paleozoic area, era, which was 200 to 600 million years ago. Now they are very, very different from other echinoderms because they're attaching permanently by a stalk. So they are considered sessile. They can't swim by raising and lowering their arms, and they can crawl, but for the most part, they're just attached to the ground. In terms of their feeding, so they are suspension feeders. They're going to use those outstretched arms to trap plankton. The cilia then carries that to the mouth, and their water vascular system that they have is used mostly for feeding, once again, not locomotion like the sea stars we discussed earlier. They also lack a nerve ring, but they have something called a nerve mass. And this has radial nerves that extend through each arm, and it also helps control the tube feet. Finally, in terms of reproduction, most of them, once again, are dioecious. There are monoecious species, though, and in these ones, the male gametes develop first to allow for cross-fertilization. These are also capable of regeneration, which is a very common trend along the echinoderms. They're very well known for their regeneration abilities. And that is all for your notes.